Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to our series of guest lectures. Um, so, uh, if you remember, um, in our class so far, we covered different aspects. We read different papers on robot manipulation and covered different <coughs> aspects. And, uh, you know, a class of objects that we talked about, like, while most of the papers focused on rigid bodies, uh, there were papers we focused on deformable objects, uh, deformable bodies, right? And so now we actually have uh, Professor Shuran Song who will be focusing uh, on deformable, we'll be talking about our work on deformable objects. So it's my absolute ple pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Shuran Song. Shuran Song is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at Columbia University. Before that, she received her PhD in computer science at Princeton University. Her research interests lie at the intersection of computer vision and robotics. Her work has received uh, so many awards, like um, including the best paper award at you know, Transactions on Robotics uh, 2020, best systems paper award at uh, Coral 2021, um, um, RSS 19, Best Manipulation Systems Paper Award from Amazon uh, in 2018, and also has been finalist for Best Paper Awards at you know, ICRA, CVPR, RSS, IROS, all of these. She's also a recipient of NSF Career Award, uh, Sloan Research Fellowship, as well as research awards uh, from every industry that you can think of, like TRI, Microsoft, Amazon, JP Morgan, and Google. So with that, uh, Shiran, uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. And it's so nice to see all the students in the classroom. I, I hope that next time I can visit you guys uh, in person. It's not too far. I'm in New York. You guys yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> yeah. And we'll probably do a bigger thing. Like we'll have you come give a talk to the larger robotics community. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Shiran. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Shiran. 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 Thank so um, yeah, maybe let's get started. And if you have any question, you can just speak out and I, can, I think I can hear you guys. I thought you are loud enough. Okay, so, um, oops. Okay, so I, I typically like to start uh, this talk by just kind of remind us how typical or common deformable object is in our daily lives. So here I just trying to draw like a typical morning routine for most of us. So I, I kind of want to, like remind us that even within just the first hour of our day, we already kind of interact with a wide variety of deformable objects, uh, like the folding your blanket, uh, wipe your face with towels, and put on masks, this and that, right? So, and we can actually very easily manipulate uh, all of them without really thinking about it. A lot of times, like even <clears throat> without we fully wake up, we can manipulate them accurately and robustly. Um, but the problem is that this kind of a seemingly trivial task of accurately manipulating deformable objects uh, is still a big uh, open challenge for robotics or today's robotic systems. Uh, and if you actually take a look on most of the robot systems uh, today, both in industry and in academic, we can kind of see that they're often designed to um, specifically designed to handle rigid objects with some rigid assumptions and also using kind of very rigid movement. And then, however, um, different from rigid objects, uh, deformable objects actually have uh, often has much more complex uh, dynamics uh, due to their extremely high degree of freedoms. So a lot of people actually um, will consider it as a near infinite degree of freedoms. And um, also what makes things uh, even worse is that among all these degree of freedom, actually only a, a very small number of them can be directly controlled by the robot uh, through contact. So in another words, the whole system, once you involve a deformable object or cloth, uh, it all of a sudden become uh, highly underactuated. So 
Uh, so here is a very concrete example. Uh, if you have a robot that's able to hold a piece of cloth, so all it can control directly through contact is a small region on the cloth uh, uh, next to the gripper. Um, and uh, while well, the rest of the cloth kind of just hang there and the robot do not have any direct control over those outer contact positions. Right? So this kind of under actuation really make uh, manipulating deformable objects uh, challenging compared to rigid objects. And uh, so as a result, a lot of those uh, typical action primitives that we designed uh, specifically for, uh, for manipulating rigid objects like pick and press actions are often kind of highly inefficient for deformable objects. Right? So um, since each time uh, the robots, you, when they are applying pick and press action, um, this, this kind of action can only affect a small region of the cost. It cannot actually just directly change the configuration of all the uh, vertices on the cost. So that's why it's kind of inefficient. And then in addition to the efficiency, uh, this kind of pick and place action also kind of limits uh, the range of tasks a system can perform. Since the robots now can, uh, cannot really directly manipulate the objects or the, the part of the object that is out, outside its kinematic range. So um, in my opinion, I think uh, this choice of using quasi-static action, which is like this kind of slow pick and place action, has really become the common limitation for many uh, prior works in class manipulation. So although we can, in the past 20 years, there are many uh, sophisticated algorithms that developed to kind of try to model deformable objects or try to better model deformable objects. The resulting system is oftentimes uh, still inefficient um, where they can easily take hundreds of steps just to try to, for example, unfold a small piece of class or uh, manipulating them. But on the other hand, uh, we human actually uh, manipulate deformable <clears throat> objects in a very different manner, right? So here are just a few examples of videos where we often use very fast and the fluent uh, motion that try to fully leverage the dynamics of the deformable objects in order to uh, quickly achieve our goal. So formally, we can try to categorize these two types of manipulation strategy as uh, dynamic manipulation and quasi static manipulation. So the main difference uh, is that in quasi-static manipulation, the system will always try its best to avoid task dynamics by using slow and careful uh, movement. So oftentimes the system will basically assume that the whole system is, is static as, as, as soon as the, the robot stops moving. Right? And then on the other hand, dynamic manipulation will actually try to embrace and leverage those dynamics instead of avoiding them in order to manipulate objects. So fundamentally, what dynamic manipulation allows the system to do is to make use of those accelerations in action uh, in order to control those out of contact positions on objects. Uh, therefore, I think for deformable objects, basically, it actually allows the system to obtain more control over the total, degree, uh, total number of degree of freedom on the objects. So I think this kind of uh, advantage or capability is directly addressing one of the core challenge for deformable objects and manipulation, which is caused by the high degree of freedom and under actuation. So here are a few examples of uh, applying dynamic manipulation strategy on deformable objects, uh, such as fling uh, a, a cloth or swing a, a rope or opening up a, a deformable bag with active air flows, right? So in all these examples, we can uh, highlight the position or the location on the objects that has been manipulated by the robot. Um, however, it's not directly in contact with the robots throughout the manipulation process. So um, in, in today's talk, I will get into details of uh, some of these examples and, and show how we can allow the robot to use this kind of dynamic manipulation to, uh, 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 to efficiently manipulate deformable objects. Um, but before that, uh, I want to put out a question. Basically, if uh, the dynamic action or dynamic manipulation is so well suited for deformable objects, then we have then why we haven't really using it yet, right? So, what are the major barriers for preventing us to uh, uh, deploy dynamic manipulation? So, I, I think there are three uh, uh, biggest challenges. So, first is uh, about modeling this complex action sequence. Right? So, for example. If we try to design a simple pick and place action, uh, we can uh, easily parameterize them with two locations, pick location and place location, or like two poses. However, specifying a dynamic action uh, is much more complex, which often requires specifying the velocity and accelerations 
Therefore, the learning algorithm for dynamic action also needs to handle this kind of much larger parameter space. So that's the first challenge. And then the second challenge is the, the complex object dynamics, right? So our object motion under dynamic action uh, is uh, much more influenced by its physical properties. And many of them is actually very hard to measure, especially uh, for deformable objects. So therefore it's really requires the system or the policy to actively adapt to those um, complex dyna object dynamics. And I think the last is about seem to real gap. Uh, I think at this moment, uh, we, we probably can all agree that the class or deformable object simulator is still far from perfect, uh, especially when dynamics are involved. So it means that uh, we need a system that can either uh, um, quickly and effectively collect the training data in the real world, or being able to uh, perform ro robust seem to real adaptation uh, when they're deployed in the real world. So I think that's the three uh, challenge for applying dynamic manipulation for deformable objects. And in today's talk, I will try to use some of our recent uh, projects to show some possible solutions for those challenges. And uh, uh, we will start with relatively simple, uh, simple task uh, like class unfolding that may not require very precise control. And then we will move uh, towards more challenging tasks that actually is goal conditioned that has a much higher requirements on precision. Okay, so first let's talk about Flingbot, which is actually our first attempt of using dynamic manipulation for the task of class unfolding. So class unfolding uh, is actually has a very simple uh, task objective, uh, objective that basically we're trying to maximize the visible surface area of any given class. Right? So this task is, you can imagine it's a very common first step for almost any class manipulation pipelines. Uh, in order to fold the class or in order to recognize the class, the first step oftentimes the system needs to unfold it so that the key point on the class is visible. However, just like uh, many tasks in robotics, uh, while the objective is simple, doing the task uh, very robustly and quickly with the robot is uh, still very hard. So here is a, a video of two robot arms that is trained to unfold a t-shirt using uh, the pick and place actions. So you can see that it actually take, well, it takes the system very long time to make uh, some small progress. And that if the class or the t-shirt is larger than the robot's reach range, the class will actually never be fully unfolded. So what that means is that if you're um, in, in, in real life, uh, if your blanket is longer than your arm length, uh, then you're never able to fully unfold the blanket, uh, which is not very ideal in like, real applications. But obviously that's not how we would unfold like a big piece of class or such as blankets, right? So very likely uh, we are instead do something similar to this video where we'll grasp the class with two hands and then try to fling it with high velocity in order to unfold it. So this example uh, just shows that what's really missing for our robot system is the capability of using high velocity dynamic manipulation and which is also the key idea behind Flingbot. So basically just, uh, give the robot the ability to use as action such as fling. So using this idea, Flingbot is able to achieve over 80% uh, coverage with three interaction steps. So this system also able to work on class that are larger than its physical reach range and the generalized different shapes and garments that is now trained on. So the whole system is only trained on rectangular class, but it's able to generalize different uh, type of class. And here's a little bit more details about how we actually uh, train this system or uh, enable this system. So first, uh, this is our robot setup uh, where we use the two UR5 uh, robot arm and also two RGBB camera for this setup. The first camera is taking a front view of the workspace. Uh, basically that is used to, after the class is being picked up, is, uh, that camera is used to predict the stretching uh, primitives that I'm gonna talk about in a bit. And the second uh, camera is actually the main camera, which is a top-down camera that's uh, used to uh, capture the observation and also uh, supervision, uh, predicting the, the delta coverage. So what the algorithm, um, uh, what the policy needs to do is to take the, the top-down image as input and output the parameters for the fling action, uh, which we are gonna talk about in a bit. And after each of the action, uh, at, uh, the top-down, or each of the interaction, the top-down camera will try to capture image of the class and then compute the delta coverage of the class before and after the interaction. 
and then use this delta uh, coverage as a supervision signal to train the network. So basically, we want to encourage the action that uh, can introduce larger delta coverage, means that it's more unfolded. And then in the end of each of the episodes, the system will also automatically reset the cost state um, uh, and uh, basically by randomly pick and drop the cost back to the workspace. Uh, therefore, the whole system is able to learn uh, with only self-supervision uh, self with minimal human intervention. So here is our, uh, the, our design of the flame primitives. So it actually has uh, involved four steps, such as picking up the cloth, stretching it, fling it with a high velocity, and then finally put it down. So to, in order to perform this primitive, uh, we need to choose uh, where to pick, how far to stretch, and how fast to fling, and where to place. However, for the task of cloth unfolding, there are actually a lot of uh, natural answers for those questions. So for instance, we always want the cloth to be stretched as much as possible, and we always want the, uh, the placement to be somewhere in the workspace so that it's easier to be uh, picked up again. Right, so after we uh, fix uh, those primitives, then what remaining less uh, left to learn is where to grasp and how fast to flee. And uh, uh, we actually, uh, in our real world setup, we actually uh, observed that the grasping position is actually much more important uh, to unfolding compared to the fling primitives, or the uh, fling uh, velocities. So for example, if we vary the fling height and the speed manually, um, but the, the, the system is still able to achieve a good unfolding performance as soon as the grasp point on the t-shirt is good. So in this example, we actually ask the system always grasp on the shoulder. Uh, so as soon as the grasping position is good, actually the fling height and the speed actually doesn't matter that much. So for this, uh, based on this observation, we actually fix the fling speed and the focus on learning uh, to choose the, the good grasping positions for uh, unfolding. So what we just did here is we actually has drastically reduced the task of learning parameters for this very complex multi-step primitive uh, to a much easier task of learning how to find the two good grasping positions. However, just to learn this uh, effective grasping strategy is still a kind of tricky task, especially if we consider uh, two robot arms. So in order to avoid collision, uh, there is a few constraints that we actually need them, uh, the grasping position, uh, the grasp point prediction to satisfy, such as cross over constraint means that the two arms should not cross over each other, or the, uh, the grasp width constraint means that they shouldn't be too close, too far away. So given these two constraints, we need to, what we need to do is to design our action parameterization that can easily satisfy those constraints. So a, straight, uh, a straightforward way to formulate uh, this action prim uh, parameter is to directly predicting the left and right grasping points independently. However, the constraint will then be entangled together under this formulation. And it's actually easy, uh, harder to uh, filter out those invalid grasping points afterwards. So instead, what we choose uh, is to use another formulation where we will try to predict the center point of the left, uh, between the left and right grasping position, which we labeled as C in this uh, example. And then additionally, we also predict the angle uh, between this uh, left and right grasping point and the grasp width uh, W. So this parameterization allows us to compute the two grasping points directly using simple trigonometry. And, we, uh, and the, the resulting grasping position always satisfies the constraints that we talked about earlier. So now what we need to do is predict the parameters C, theta, and uh, W. Um, and uh, in order to improve the learning efficiency, uh, like basically means that we want to train the, the policy with fewer uh, examples, uh, what we do is try to inject some inductive bias in the learning process. So in particular, we observe that uh, for the task of class unfolding, the best grasping positions has a few equivalence with respect to the input image observation. And we want the system to actually leverage this equivalence uh, in order to uh, improve the sample, the learning efficiency. So for example, uh, the, the grasping point should be translational uh, equivalent. So what that means is that if the class is shifted in the workspace, uh, the, um, the optimal grasp position should be shifted together uh, with, with respect to the input. And then similarly, uh, the grasp position should also be equivalent to rotation and scale. And then to kind of leverage this equivalence idea, uh, we actually uh, implement uh, the value network as a spatial action map uh, in order to evaluate all the grasp candidates. So the key idea for a spatial action map um, is that whenever we try to reason about, uh, for example, rotation or scales in the output parameterization, 
we want to kind of offload this reasoning to transforming the input image. So in another word, it says rather than uh, try to rotate and scale the grasping parameters, uh, we can rotate and scale the image input and then infer the scores for the, a fixed grasping parameter. So for example, uh, given an input image, uh, like we see it um, captured from the top down uh, camera, uh, we can scale and uh, rotate uh, those images in order to obtain a collection of transformed input image. And then uh, where the, actually the, the scale is corresponding to different grasp width, and then the rotation I will actually corresponding to different grasp angles. And then we'll, the, next, the value network will basically predict a dense value map for each pixel. And where each of the pixels corresponding to one grasping center, uh, 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 grasping uh, center location, uh, which is the parameter C that we described in the earlier parameterization. And then the action selection is basically done by simply pick the pixel with the highest grasp value among all the scale rotations. Uh, and then uh, the whole network is able to train directly to predict the delta, uh, delta coverage area uh, that is computed from the top-down cam uh, camera. So um, after we change the system, both in simulation and the real world, so here is actually the, the system in action that we're going to show you some of the videos of Greenbaum and also the comparisons. So here we actually compared our system with uh, uh, the, uh, the same system by using pick and place actions. Right? So below, uh, we actually plot the uh, class average, uh, class coverage with respect to the interaction steps, um, where basically uh, higher is better. Um, is, uh, and uh, you can see that for Flingbot, it's able to kind of reach over 90% of coverage within three interaction steps, where pick and place uh, system actually take a long time to make some small progress. And here is another example of a large rectangle, uh, large rectangle class. So this one actually is larger than the, uh, the rich range of uh, the UR5 robot. And here is an example of a t-shirt. Uh, so as I uh, described earlier, for all the training, we only trained uh, the system with rectangular class. Uh, so it never see class like t-shirt or other uh, garments but it's the system is able to generalize to different shapes reasonably well. And here are some quantitative results and comparisons. So um, we compared with two quality static baselines that use pick and place and pick and drag. And we also actually include a variant of our method that uh, actually indeed learn the flowing speed on top of the grasping uh, positions. So we actually train this system with reinforced learning in order to predict optimal speed uh, for different um, and condition on the visual observations. However, what we observe is that it's not significantly better than the original fling bots uh, that's only predicting the grasping position. Therefore, we actually decided to use a simpler version of um, or, uh, the, the algorithm as our final approach. Okay, so to summarize for, for, for fling bots, uh, what we, I think the, the most uh, surprising thing or uh, interesting thing we learned through the, this kind of development uh, process is that even without explicitly modeling the cost state or uh, using any complex learning strategy, Flingbot is able to work very well <coughs> of class unfolding. So I think this kind of simplicity of this method really highlights the key takeaway for Flingbot, which is dynamic action is just really good for a task like class unfolding. And then to address the challenge associated with learning, we introduce an action prioritization that prevents a collision. And we also learn the value network that exploits uh, the equivariance of the problem structure to improve the learning efficiency. So any questions so far for uh, the fling bomb before we move on? Um, yeah, I had a question about the stretch primitive. So mm -hmm. you said like for stretch, you can stretch, you should ideally stretch as much as you can. So do you have like a manually defined threshold for say the joint talks or the position between the two indicators? Like how do you decide that limit? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, that's a detail that I didn't mention, but we basically, we have a, a front a camera that's actually looking at the class after the, the class being picked up. So that stretching uh, primitive is actually kind of trying to detect the curve on the top. Oh. Yeah, so when, when there's a curve, it means that it's not fully stretched. And uh, when there's a straight line, it means that it's uh, fully stretched. So we use that heuristic to, to stretch the class as far as possible. Cool. Any um, more questions? Can I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, this is really cool work. Um, so have you, uh, so when you fling, 
fling them, right? Like you are using fixed height and everything. Uh, the fling action itself, is that also fixed? I'm just uh, curious because um, if you want to generalize to clothes that are very heavy, yeah. you know, the material is different, very heavy, maybe when you stretch them, when you fling them and you drop them, they are not fully stretched yet, right? So I was just curious. Yeah, I think that's, that's indeed a good, uh, the right observation. I think for, as you can see that we, we, we test on cloth that has kind of similar width uh, and, and the material properties. And the other, yeah, byproduct of that is that probably the, the fling speed and height doesn't matter that much. But uh, as, uh, very soon I will show you some of the failure cases for fling ball. When you're getting very large cloth or very heavy cloth, um, you, uh, it's actually not working that well. And I think one way is actually thinking about incorporating more parameters like height and speed. And, uh, but we, we show actually another uh, possible solution for that problem. Cool. It's coming in a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that's a lead to my next slide, which is the fling ball oh, communication. Um, yeah, so actually, indeed, uh, fling ball, um, one of the very typical failure case uh, is when the class become uh, larger and heavier. So in this case, it's actually, we try to unfold a long uh, dress. So it's actually longer than the t-shirt that we test on. And uh, in those cases, the robot actually is not able to produce a, in, in, uh, sufficient speed in order to fully unfold the, uh, the, the dress. Actually, we, we manually tune the height and the speed. And I think the, the, the real bottleneck is actually the, the speed of the robot. Uh, if they cannot uh, fling with a higher speed, then it cannot really fully unfold this class. And at most, it can only like half unfold this class. And, and, uh, and if we want to increase the speed of the robot, uh, it can potentially become dangerous, if, especially if the robot gonna operate around human. Um, so um, anything we can do. So <laughs> you know, in our follow-up work, we actually try to address this problem by introducing additional aero, uh, uh, aerodynamics to, for, for manipulation. So we call this system um, dexterity uh, with air in it. So in this work, we actually let the robots to control additional air blower and then try to uh, learn a closed loop policy to control this, um, the direction of the blower in order to unfold uh, uh, different uh, clouds. So in this case, it's this dress. So uh, the system actually, once it, they're able to like control a blower to like uh, decide the direction to blow, it can actually easily unfold a very diverse set of clouds, including this uh, large dress. Um, and also another side benefit is that in this new framework, uh, we could easily replace all these three robots with some very cheap and slow hardware because we no longer require very fast robot movement. And uh, this air pump actually you can buy it from Amazon with $20 and uh, you can get a very effective uh, system already. And uh, of course, uh, the, in addition to unfolding class, I think error-based manipulation can also be applied to many other applications. So here are just two examples. One is opening a deformable bag. If you want to put objects into the bag, it's the first step is to open it, and or blowing leaves uh, or small particles into a target area. So in general, I think uh, this kind of error-based manipulation really allows the system to simultaneously apply a lot of forces in a 3D space or a large 3D surface without direct contact. Uh, which is a pretty unique advantage compared to contact-based manipulation. So uh, actually, it's, it's kind of interesting to think about manipulation that's not always require contact uh, if you use air. Um, yeah, so today I probably not have time to go into details for these two projects, uh, but you can go to the web, uh, website to check out the videos and also how, how we actually train the model. Um, so apart from uh, not able to handle very large uh, fabrics, I think another limitation for fling ball that I also want to mention is uh, its limited capability in handling low condition tasks. Um, yeah, so in particular, it, because it doesn't really uh, have a very high precision in terms of controlling its actions. So uh, in the cross unfolding tasks, the algorithm only needs to kind of care about the total coverage um, without really worry about the actual configurations of the garments. So as a result, uh, all the examples I'm showing you here uh, on the right, they are can be kind of considered as equally good for this task of unfolding. Um, but obviously they are not uh, in the same configuration and therefore insufficient for many real applications that has much uh, higher requirements on position, right? So if you want to fold a class or if you want to do anything uh, after unfolding, then you, oftentimes we require the, the, the class to reach certain configurations or certain goal conditions. 
Um, so in the next project, uh, we will try to focus on this kind of harder task, uh, which uh, actually is goal conditions. So specifically, what is a goal condition task, uh, especially for uh, in the context of deformable object manipulation? So here is two examples. One is trying to uh, whip or swing a rope to hit a target position. So here the goal uh, is defined by the, the target position. And the other is kind of uh, similar to uh, fling, is like trying to swing a tablecloth into a target configuration. So in both tasks, the goal condition is defined by the target key point. So uh, either the key point is the tip of the rope or the corners of the cloth. And since the target is still outside the system's reach range or the kinematic reach range, uh, therefore it still requires the system to use dynamic actions in order to reach those goal conditions. So um, in fact, uh, there is a good reason that's why we try to avoid this task in our earlier work, for example, fling box, simply because it's uh, too hard. And we have been trying to look away from this kind of hard problems. So here is a concrete reason why. So first, unlike the quasi-static manipulation, an object's motion under dynamic action is often highly influenced by these physical properties. But at the same time, a deformable object's physical properties are often defined by many hard to measure parameters, such as uh, stiffness or nonlinear density distributions. Right? So as a result, this combo of dynamic manipulation and deformable objects make it extremely hard for the robots to plan its action accurately in order to achieve a precise goal condition. All right, so in fact, this is a task that's even challenging for a human or for us. All right, so given a new rope, I think it's very unlikely to you can just hit the, the goal with, within the first trial. However, the good thing is that after a few attempts, we are often able to get closer and closer to the goal and eventually uh, reach the goal. So the question is that, can we, like, what we are learning through this trial and error process, right? Um, I guess, are we actually learned the accurate mapping from the action to the full trajectory? I think probably not, at least I, I don't think I can predict that. Or are we trying to like decode the, the exact physical rope parameters from this uh, trial and error process, kind of like system identification? I guess, not either, right? Because I, I, I think the, the parameters for the rope is actually really hard to estimate accurately. So I think instead, what we really rely on is a good intuition, or we can call it prior knowledge, about how to adjust our action in order to affect the trajectory. So basically, what we are uh, uh, relying on is something really simple, such as if we swing harder, uh, the rope will actually go higher. And if we extend the, our arm more, then we'll, uh, the, the rope can reach further, right? So we kind of just rely on this simple intuition in order to adjust our action iteratively in order to get closer and closer to the goal. So in this project, we call this intuition our residual policy. And the our hypothesis uh, is that this knowledge about this change is much easier to learn and also potentially much more uh, easier to transfer to different ropes that has different dynamics. So based on this intuition, uh, we uh, propose this algorithm called iterative uh, residual policy. So at its core, uh, it's like the, the, the actual model uh, is actually a learned a delta that dynamics model. That's what it takes in is the observation of a, a observer trajectory. And uh, another uh, input is the delta action um, which is uh, the data action that you're going to apply on the, uh, the current action. And then what is trying to predict the output is the updated trajectory, assuming that we apply this delta action on top of the observed action. Right, so here the robot action is parameterized with, uh, by its target joint angle and the uh, maximum joint speed. And then um, after we learn this model or like uh, during the learning of this model, what we do is that we can sample different delta actions. And then we can predict their corresponding trajectories with respect to different delta actions. And then um, uh, the, the algorithm can actually select the delta action that actually getting, uh, help the system to getting closer to the goal. And then uh, with that, the algorithm could iteratively uh, select and improve its action in order to get closer and closer to the goal. So uh, here is actually showing you the, the best the delta action selected by the policy. And then in the next iteration, we'll basically apply this delta action on the current action. And hopefully uh, that will uh, get the system closer to the goal. And the one thing to note is that uh, this uh, 
Delta Dynamics model is actually fully trained, in, like entirely trained in simulation. Uh, and we actually use a module to, to, uh, to generate the simulation data. But as you can imagine, uh, for this task, there is actually a huge sim to real gap, uh, uh, especially when we are using like a module, like this kind of simplified simulation system or like simplified rope models. Um, so here is actually an example of the simulated uh, rope trajectory and uh, the real world uh, uh, rope trajectory. So you can see that there is a, like a, a huge gap, even for the rope that actually has uh, exactly the same measured parameters. For example, we measure the length of the rope and we also measure the linear density of the rope and we model it uh, exactly on the, in the simulation. Even with that, uh, the, the, the difference is really, uh, really big. But the hope is that um, we really hope that the, the learned delta dynamics, especially its general direction, is generalizable to a uh, real world and objects with uh, different physical properties. So although uh, the learned dynamics may not be precise, but as, as long as the direction is correct, then we can actually iteratively adjust the action uh, based on this direction. Okay, so here is a system in action. Uh, so at each uh, iteration, uh, the rope trajectory is tracked by a calibrated camera. Uh, and the distance to the goal is measured by the shortest distance along the trajectory. Uh, and then the algorithm will sample a set of delta actions and then predict the, their trajectory using the learned uh, uh, delta dynamics model. And then the action associated with the smallest distance will be selected for the next iteration. So in this visualization, we always show the best trajectory on the top. Um, and I think unfortunately this video actually doesn't play to the end. It's actually a full trajectory that has an arc that uh, goes to the end. Um, but you, you can always check the, the project web page for the, all the videos. Um, but for now, let's assume that it actually achieved the full, uh, full trajectory, and then um, the system will actually use this observation to update its uh, sample action for the next iteration. OK, so yeah, th this kind of uh, iteration will be basically be repeat until uh, the system either reach to the goal or reach to the maximum uh, number of steps. And in our experiment, we actually try to systematically evaluate or validate the system's uh, ability to generalize to different conditions. So, uh, so basically, whether it can generalize to real-world dynamics, uh, objects with different or new physical parameters, or even variations on the robot hardware environment. So in all the following experiments, we're going to show you the results of the same model that's trained in simulation. So first, uh, we're going to show you the testing results on different ropes. And the, uh, as you can see, that many of the, uh, these ropes actually are significant out of training distribution, where we only train uh, the, uh, the model on, the, on one of the ropes uh, that uh, is circled by the, the green box. And uh, before I show you the results, I kind of want to just, again, highlight how challenging this task is. So here we actually show the rope trajectories captured under the same robot action. However, due to the, uh, the different physical properties on rope, such as their error resistance or mass distribution, the resulting trajectory of the, those ropes actually varies quite drastically. Therefore, the robot really uh, needs to adapt its uh, policy in your, uh, based on its visual feedbacks in order to generalize to novel ropes with unknown parameters. So here's the results trajectory, hope it plays, um, that after the policy converges. Great, it, it actually plays. So, <laughs> So you can see that the, the, the system actually um, is able to choose to use different actions in order to achieve the same goal uh, to accommodate different job dynamics. And next, uh, we also validate the system's generalization capability with respect to different robot hardware environments. So what we do in this experiment is that we change the length of the last link, the robot's last link, which basically changes the mapping between the robot's action and the, its effects. So in this case, the system is forced to adapt to new uh, hardware embodiments using the uh, visual observations. So in our system, we actually, uh, the system is actually trained with a, a 50 centimeter uh, length link, but uh, the, the longer and shorter links is out of training distribution. And here's the results. So as expected uh, for the, the, the robot actually, uh, for the robots with different link lengths compared to the training setup, it always start with much higher initial error. But regardless, it's able to quickly adjust and then also adapt to the different 
to the new embodiment uh, according to the visual feedback and then achieve a, a lower uh, error in the later steps and converge um, to a good solution. Okay, so in the final experiment, uh, we try to kind of uh, stretch test the system. Um, it's uh, so basically how, how well the system can adapt to online changes. So what we do is that we uh, first let the system converges on a given rope and a go. So we can see the plot is reached to a low error. And then what we do is we try to interrupt the system by tying a few knots on the rope. So this uh, tying action is actually change a few pretty critical uh, parameters on the rope, such as the rope's length and also its linear density. Right? And then after we're done tying the knots, we can ob immediately observe that the system well, has a much higher error after this uh, interaction. However, after one or two iterations of adjustment, the policy can quickly adapt to the new system uh, dynamics and then regain a good accuracy. And here is uh, a little bit of uh, quantitative comparisons. So the method on the uh, leftmost is actually a very strong baseline, uh, whereas the algorithm used the optimal action, uh, optimized in simulation for each of the individual ropes. Uh, however, uh, so for, 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 for that baseline, we actually manually measure the rope parameters and then uh, find the optimal policy in the simulation, uh, which is module simulation that we use. However, you can still observe a very high error, like around 20 centimeter error for uh, most of the cases, which really highlights this very big seem to real gap for this, that, uh, this task. And we also compare with uh, other methods used, for example, system identification and a linear dynamics model. And uh, uh, you can find more details in our paper if you uh, care about these comparisons. And uh, finally, we also want to demonstrate the general, uh, the generality of our approach or this iterative residual policy approach. So what we do is we try to uh, apply the same method to a, a class placement task with minimal modifications. So instead of uh, handling only 1D deformable object like a rope, we want to see whether they can generalize to a 2D deformable objects like a class. So the goal for this uh, class placement task is to kind of uh, swing a, a, a class and place it on the table uh, uh, given a target pose, right? So here the pose is defined by uh, nine different key point locations on the class. And again, the algorithm does not know about the physical parameters of the class. Therefore, it's uh, actually requires the system to adapt its policy according to different physical parameters. So here are typical, uh, a two different strategy, but also a typical strategy learned by the algorithm for different class. Right? So in the uh, first case, so actually in the first step, uh, the, the policy will actually use the same action for different class to start. And we can see that in the first example, the class actually lands too close compared to the goal com uh, configuration. And in the second example, the right example, the same action actually caused the class to fold by itself uh, due to the high class density. So with that observation, uh, this, the policy will try to increase the stroke in the first uh, case in order to swim further, but also decrease its speed to prevent folding in the second case. And then the, the algorithm will actually continue to adjust this action on, until it achieves its goal. So for this task, actually, it typically takes uh, around three steps for this policy to converge. So as you can see, this formulation of uh, iterative residual policy is actually very general, and it can be uh, applicable for many repeatable tasks with complex dynamics. And so here I actually highlight so the word repeatable means that uh, because one of the uh, key assumptions and also kind of maybe a limitation for this approach is that it, it do assume that for after every uh, try and error, it can fully reset its state, right? So if it cannot do that, then um, uh, it cannot really adjust its action accordingly because each time it actually starts with a different initial state. So, but if your task is repeatable and even your task has very complex dynamics like deformable objects, then you can consider using this kind of res iterative residual policy uh, for those tasks. And I think what we learned uh, from this project is that instead of trying to learn this uh, full dynamic model that's mapped directly from action to its effect, which is oftentimes impossible, the algorithm can uh, learn and make use of a delta dynamics, which is much easier and generalizable to many different conditions. Uh, so yeah, so in, in particular, we actually test the system with uh, like a test the system generalization to noisy real-world dynamics uh, with unseen physical properties and also uh, 
different global hardwares. So um, I think to summarize, uh, if you want to remember uh, one sentence from today's talk, I, I hope that you can remember the importance and the benefit of incorporating dynamic action uh, in the task of uh, deformable object manipulation. Right? So the reason why uh, dynamic action is a good choice is that by leveraging those dynamics or accelerations in action, the system will now can uh, address one of the core challenges for deformable object manipulation, which is caused by its high degree of freedom and under actuation. Okay, so that is one sentence summary for the, for the talk. And if you care about how to make uh, this kind of system work, then here are some practical uh, lessons or recipes that uh, we summarize from our projects. Uh, so first, I think in order to uh, be able to handle complex uh, action sequence, we often design and use different action primitives uh, that can map this very um, this high action, uh, complex action space uh, with high dimensional typically to a low dimensional parameterization, which is much easier to learn. So for example, we can simplify the problem of learning uh, this complex fling action into predicting uh, where to grasp. And in the last project, we actually parameterize the whole swing action with the target joint angle and speed. And then in order to handle uh, kind of uh, the object's complex dynamics, which is unavoidable in dynamic, uh, in uh, deformable object manipulation, we could always benefit from some feedback controls uh, and simplify the learning problem by using uh, ideas like uh, residual dynamics or uh, delta dynamics, and which is much easier to learn and oftentimes more generalizable, especially compared to learning the full dynamic models that rely on very accurate system adaptation. And uh, finally, uh, in order to handle this kind of big seem to real gap, uh, we could uh, leverage either, uh, leverage either uh, self supervised learning in real world, basically that allows the system to collect its own training data directly on real world, or kind of uh, rely on online adaptation, uh, which uh, a, a good example is the last iterative residual policy um, project. So that is a summary for, uh, for my today's talk with all the three projects. And uh, it is the end of my talk and uh, uh, all the code for all these three, three projects is already uh, available online. So if you go to the GitHub, you can check them out and then uh, play with them. So all the code, actually all the system actually have the simulation component and the real world component. And we try to uh, release all the code for both sides. Yeah, so I'm happy to take questions uh, if you have any. Sure. Questions? Um, Shiran, um, I had a couple of questions. Uh, mm -hmm. For the second project, um, what was your prediction horizon? Was it just the next step or like sometime in future? Uh, which one exactly? Is uh, the R one? Uh, or no, the one, the, the, rope, uh, the rope thing, when yeah, it's the, trying to go to the rope. Yeah, yeah so the, the rope thing is we're predicting the target. So, we bit, so the action primitive is it always start with the same joint configuration. And we're trying to predict is a target joint configuration and the maximum velocity. Um, so, uh, and then the, the, actually the swing action is just a minimal jerk uh, trajectory. Oh, I see. So you're always trying to predict the target. I see, got it, yeah. got it. Um, I see. And uh, I was wondering also, I love the idea of delta dynamics. Um, did you add some structure to it? So for example, the example, like the, the motivation that you gave, right? Like, let's say if, it's, uh, if the rope needs to go further, you 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 extend your arm. If it needs to go higher, maybe you extend your arm in another direction or something like that. I was wondering when you map these uh, these these basically these delta dynamics, right? This uh, mm -hmm. delta in let's say uh, uh, joint angles. Did you add some structure? So let's say if the rope is much towards uh, much farther away in the horizontal direction. Your elbow and shoulder angle should be the the delta should be in the elbow and shoulder angle compared to the uh, you know uh, elbow and wrist. But if it's on the height, it's on the elbow and wrist compared to so things like that. Did you try that or was it just completely open ended? Yeah. So I I, I we didn't really uh, explicitly encode uh, that kind of part uh, or like um, uh, inductive bias in our learning problem. Um, I, I don't know whether the, the, the policy learns that. So I think that's something actually interesting. We can, we can go back and, and check, see whether the system learns some consistent uh, strategies. But I think the, the only um, structure that we add in, the, in this learning problem is that uh, the output is actually a full trajectory that we encoded as an image. 
Um, and uh, actually, the, I think the action is also, I, I think, directly concatenates with the image input. So everything is represented in a spatial manner. Um, but uh, I, I think there are maybe better ways to, to actually represent the action and, and the, uh, the trajectory so that it's actually the, the mapping is easier to learn or the delta dynamics is easier to learn. Awesome. Yeah. Any questions? Yes. Andy. This is really cool work. I'm curious about kind of your future steps. Like, are you going to go into something like folding or like more with the, the blower or something? Yeah, so a future step. I, I um there's a lot of future <laughs> things that we can do. I think folding is one thing that we indeed uh are thinking about. So although um it's it's actually surprisingly hard uh to actually if you want to develop the arrows and then able to generalize to fold different up uh different garments. So I think one of the uh challenges that I didn't mention today is uh kind of like the state representations for cause. Um, and uh, the, the challenge there is that it's basically a perception problem. So uh, in the last project, we actually try to bypass that problem by saying that we're just trying to detect the key points. Or we're trying to, uh, well, in the first project, we only care about the coverage of the cause. It doesn't really uh, consider the full configuration of the cause. We doesn't really try to perceive the cause or try to estimate the state of the cause. Um, but for deformable objects like garments or cause, they, it's actually really hard to, first perceive them because of the high degree of freedom and also self occlusions So uh, if you want uh, to achieve a goal condition that is folded, which means that the system really needs to understand this um, self occlusion properties or like the, the hidden structures of the cause. So I think that is something very interesting. And we are thinking about how to, how to get there, but I think uh, a big question there is not too much on the manipulation, but more on the perception side. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Ooh, um, well, then let's thank Shuran again. Thank you so much, Shuran, uh, for for your uh, for your for your talk. This was this was amazing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, see you guys. <laughs> uh, for folks, so next uh, on Thursday we'll have uh, Oliver. Uh, from CMU, who will talk about modes in manipulation. Um, and then uh, on Tuesday, we'll have like a fire, uh, interactive QA, fireside chat uh, with uh, SIP. Right? And it's again here, all the classes will be.